Um, meanwhile in Rome, we actually went through all of Rome last week, right? So I do have a little bit more of Rome that was farther along in the notes that as I was looking over them today, I bumped a few up. So we'll be talking about Rome a little bit more. But let's, uh, and I know a lot of you weren't here last week. So we're in the 63 to 31 AD range, 63 BC to 31 AD, right? Which is around the time of um, Christ's ministry there. We're not going to go all the way to the end of that ministry, but um, Caesar Augustus is now Emperor Caesar Augustus, and he is taking on this title, and one of his titles is the Son of God. And we ended with this emphasis last time, the fact that what we find is that Caesar Augustus, uh, of course, Caesar taking on Julius Caesar's name in order to show some sort of divine right, um, his real name being Octavian. He called himself Augustus, which means the August one, right? And um, then taking on that title, Caesar. Um, Clay, he's the first true emperor of Rome. Uh, Julius Caesar was technically the first Caesar, um, but his reign was not fully established as emperor. Uh, Augustus has that title. And remember how we got here um, through the two triumvirates, right? Uh, military leaders who formed a, a kind of a three-headed government. And the first one was in direct opposition to the Senate, and that was on the heels of the, um, the slave rebellion, the um, Third Servitile War, and Spartacus and all of those things going on, 120,000 Servile War. That's what it was, Servile, not Servitile, Servile. Um, Spartacus, 120,000 slaves who rose up, gladiators, servants, whatever else, uh, wreaked havoc in Italy until Crassus and his, his legions came back, uh, decimated them, crucified 6,000, hung them along the streets in Rome, and uh, put that down. But then throughout this time of tremendous uh, disruption, this triumvirate comes, they end up killing each other, as was often the case. Uh, Julius Caesar rises up from that. Uh, then he's assassinated. One of the people that assassinates him is Mark Antony. Uh, it, Mark Antony becomes one of the three in the second triumvirate. And that second triumvirate is given legal authority or legal standing through the Lex Titia. The Senate literally votes this triumvirate into power, and that becomes effectively the end of the Republic of Rome. Uh, it's not the end of the Republic of Rome, but effectively it is. Once you give legal standing to, to tyrants and dictators, you're done. Um, so they, um, that, that, that ends up happening. Of course, the, the three in the second triumvirate end up fighting. Long story short, Octavian wins that, right? He becomes Augustus, Caesar Augustus, and he takes control. As we get toward the turn from BC to AD, as we get toward that ever important mark in history, and just to remind us where, where we were last week, in 9 BC, we, we see this Asian provincial assembly, and they declared this about Caesar Augustus. And I, there are a lot of ellipses here for the sake of time. I don't read it all. But the most divine Caesar, and as I'm reading this, consider this in light of Jesus coming in probably about six years, OK? Jesus being born in six years, this being written about Caesar Augustus, the most divine Caesar, we should consider equal to the beginning of all things. For when everything was falling and tending toward dissolution, he restored it once more and gave the whole world a new aura. Caesar, the common good fortune of all, the beginning of life and vitality. All the cities unanimously adopt the birthday of the divine Caesar as the new beginning of the year. Whereas providence, which has regulated our whole existence, has brought our life to the climax of perfection and giving to us Augustus, whom it filled with strength for the welfare of men, and who, being sent to us and our descendants as Savior, has put an end to war and has set all things in order, and having become God manifest, Caesar hath fulfilled all the hopes of earlier times in surpassing all the benefactors who preceded him. And whereas finally the birthday of the God has been the whole, for the whole world, the beginning of the good news, literally evangelion, the same word used in the New Testament, good news, concerning him. You see all the messianic language there? Good news, God manifest, the beginning of all things, God sent, uh, this, the Savior, the one who in the time of chaos came to bring peace, 
who has ended war. And so we have, again, this establishment of expectation as it related to this interesting set of circumstances whereby just five years after this, angels are going to appear to shepherds who are watching their sheep by night and they're going to hear glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which is God with us, right? And so we're going to have all of this come up in this, this child in, in Jerusalem. And just five years earlier, Caesar Augustus was declared to be this thing, right? As, as, he's, as he's taking power. And, and we see the merging, of course, of the, the spiritual and the, the government there with Caesar, as we would expect. So this is the, this is the setting. Now, we're going to be going back in time again. I gave you Rome, um, um, and then we're going to go back in time to, to re-pick up our, our Jerusalem. But before we do so, uh, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to the, the, the republic government structure of Rome. This was primarily before the Caesars, and yet many of these names kind of rolled over into the Caesars. And what you would have uh, within the Republic of Rome is at the top there would be consuls. There were typically two, and they would be elected by a popular assembly. Uh, they were, as it were, the, the chief executives of the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, they commanded the armies in wartime, and they served one-year terms. And so you'd have a chief consul, and this would be like our president, right? Commanded the army, commander-in-chief, as it were, um, uh, chief executive of day-to-day -day operations. And then you had the Senate, and there were 300 members within the Senate, and they were responsible for foreign policy and civil government operations. Uh, they proposed the laws. They appointed governors. Uh, they had veto power over the consuls. So the consuls could do what they would, but then the, the Senate had the ability to veto the consuls. They appointed governors, as, as uh, I said, and then they uh, served for life. They did not have term limits, the senators. And that was one of the big problems in Rome, was that the Senate did not have um, term limits. And not only did they not have term limits, but they didn't have constant elections. We don't have term limits on our senators either, but at least we can unelect them, right? We can elect someone new and, and get them in there. Term limits for Senate and, and, uh, and well, term limits for all, all of Congress would be probably a really nice thing for us uh, in the United States, but they served for life, and this is one of the reasons why they became very ineffective. Um, and then you had the Council of Plebeians, and those are commoners. The plebeians, the commoners, um, that term ha uh, has only carried over in our country uh, on universities. Um, where they, the, typically the freshmen in, in certain contexts are called the plebeians um, as they're, they're ones who are, are the young ones and such. Uh, and they elected tribunes that had veto power over the consuls. They passed laws proposed by the Senate. And then you had the Assembly of Tribes. And these were those who represented the 35 districts of Rome. They voted on laws as well. And then you had the Assembly of the Centuries, uh, who were also a part of the electing of the consuls, voted on laws. And um, these were members of the nobility and of the soldier class. And these would all be on a very similar level. Then they'd inform the Senate. And the Senate, of course, would inform the consuls. So that was a general idea there of how that worked out. Um, as um, How's readable is that? That's pretty good. Uh, so you had provinces, protectorates, and then uh, within Rome, and then you had the Parthian kingdom over here. We're going to see the Parthian kingdom come up a little bit in our time, either tonight or next week. Uh, and I know that the shades aren't real, real um, uh, effective here, but there were Roman provinces, which is these darker areas. And those provinces were officially part of Rome. And then you'd have what were called protectorates. And those protectorates are, are kind of like territories, um, very similar in some ways um, to what the United States, the relationship we have with Puerto Rico, um, where Puerto Rico is not a state, but they are a United States territory, right? And um, so uh, something sort of similar to that. Um, so Palestine was not a province of Rome. It was not officially part of Rome in that sense. It was a protectorate of Rome. It was a territory that Rome, and then all of Galatia and Cappadocia, uh, Pontus, um, Lyconia, those were also just protectorates, Lycia, Cypr Cyprus, but you also, you had Syria and Sicilia and Asia and Achaia and Macedonia, Cyrene, and then of course over here you'd have Rome, and um, those were various provinces. The provinces would have some sort of legal standing in Rome, so you, if you, if you were, 
uh, again, if you think back to um, the days before, before um, many of the states were states, before when they were territories, one of the w one of the reasons why um, territories wanted statehood, they deeply wanted statehood, because if you were just a territory, then you had bureaucrats in Washington that were assigned to you, and that that uh, the non-elected bureaucrats controlled your your territory. So people that had no connection to you, no, they, they were not accountable to you. They didn't understand you. They were Washington bureaucrats, and they, were, they got control over you. And so the territories, what they desperately wanted was to be able to become a state. Because once you became a state, you got to elect your own leaders. And those leaders then were sent to Washington, and you got a say in what happened in Washington because now you have leaders. Now, now you, have, you get to elect people. You didn't get to elect people to the Senate. You got to elect people to the House. Now we elect people to the Senate. That wasn't the way it was back then. It shouldn't be right now either. Um, the Senate should not be. I, I'm not going help to. Me, help me remember not to get off on, on, on politics. But, um, but at the time, the Senate was appointed and the House was elected, right? But you had popular representation in, in Washington. And that is a huge deal. It's a huge deal that we get to elect people to represent us. And that we don't just have unelected bureaucrats in Washington who don't live here, who don't understand our culture, who don't understand our desires, who don't understand what we're going through, who read some stuff in books, and then come here and tell us what's right for us, right? And so Palestine never became a province, which means they never had any of that representation from the districts. They never had any, any sort of representation. They just had uh, unelected bureaucrats who ruled over them. Um, and then several of the, these other areas as well, down through Egypt and all that also. Um, final map here before we move on back into Israel. Um, this is the Roman Empire as it grew over time. This darkest area here were the regions that were conquered by Augustus from 30 BC to 14 AD. And then by the death of Augustus, you have some of these lighter areas that um, were all apart. And then by the end of Trajan's reign in 117 AD, you had um, this larger area and um, such, and then some major battles are marked there as well. So you can see that a very large portion of the world was under Roman authority, including all of what is now France and Spain and much of, um, much of well, all of Western Europe, even up into Britain there, uh, was conquered during the reign of Trajan. And you had Germania, and they um, were still uh, in, in that region there. But that's the general area that, that we find for the Roman Empire. Of course, a lot of this would have been after, some of this would have been after Augustus, but a good portion, especially of this immediate section, that's all, or a, a vast majority of that was established in the days of Augustus. Now remember, and if we go back to this other map, uh, there's some dotted lines here that show you uh, a road system that Rome had put together, and it, it would get even farther as, as things begin to grow, that road system becomes Im an imperative of the gospel. Um, the gospel was facilitated by the fact that those roads were built, they were protected, they were patrolled by Roman soldiers, which means you could go from point A to point B in relative safety, uh, it, uh, you, you could go there fa thus somewhat faster. Um, there was infrastructure. And infrastructure is what the gospel needs to be able to spread. Um, it's interesting. You had a very m major spread of the gospel during the Roman Empire because of infrastructure. The next time you had a major, major spread of the gospel was the missionary movement because... Britain, Britain owned better than half the world. The infrastructure of the British Empire actually is what facilitated the gospel spreading so effectively. I wonder if at some point the internet might become that next infrastructure 
whereby the gospel will spread effectively. If, if there is to be another revival, we know, uh, and, and if it's to be a, a, a widespread revival, we know the internet will have a big part to play in it. But it seems like with each major infrastructure advance, the gospel finds its way into that infrastructure at some point. Uh, and we know the gospel is already having an effect, but there hasn't been a revival because of the internet. And there may not be because the internet is like a wild west and it's, it's a trash heap. But, um, but maybe, just maybe, um, it's, it's a possibility. Okay, any questions or thoughts on these maps and, uh, of Rome? I know we got through Rome quickly. Most of last week was on Rome. So that's why we didn't hit it hard. Okay, let's go back in time a little bit. Back to um, the, the 50s BC. Israel is a tributary to Rome during these turbulent Roman years. Remember, during the reign, during this time between Hyrcanus and Aristobulus II, they're fighting back and forth. Uh, Antip uh, Antipater or Antipas, who's the king of Idumea, works with Hyrcanus, but he's uh, uh, deposed for a time by, by uh, Archelaus, uh, not Archelaus, um, uh, Aristobulus II. Uh, Aristobulus has power until such time as Rome deems him to be a bit of a threat, so they put Hyrcanus back in power. That's where we left them last time, and, and we started going into Rome and talking through what was going on in Rome at the time. In 54 BC, Triumvir, Crassus, right? So Crassus was one of the in initial of the three, the, 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 one of the initial three of the first triumvirate. And he, um, yeah, second triumvirate. I think. Crassus. I don't remember now. Let's double check. Julius Caesar. So that would be, that would be the, the, the first. Yeah, Marcus Crassus and, and Julius Caesar and Pompey. So that's the first triumvirate. Um, and Crassus would be killed in 53, but this is in 54. So one year before Crassus is killed, he robs the temple of its riches a year before his death. Now remember, this is Zerubbabel's temple. This is not Solomon's temple. So this is not a grand, grand temple. And, and it's not the renovation of Zerubbabel's temple yet. That'll be under Herod in a few years. But um, he does rob the temple of its riches. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Israel has no power anymore. Rome has taken all that power away. Remember, they had a, a, a very small period of time 80 years, if we're generous, where Israel was sovereign, between Syria being deposed and Rome ta uh, finally taking over. We're past that now. Uh, when the Roman Civil War began in 49 BC, the provinces became a, a major source of funding for that uh, turmoil. That would be the Civil War among the Triumvirate. And uh, not the first Triumvirate, because they're dead, but the second Triumvirate. Um, so each Roman step... Right? Each time Rome is coming in, they're levying taxes, uh, they're, they're, they're plundering resources. Uh, you've got these, these, these men that are fighting over Rome. Uh, at this point, it would be Octavian and, and Mark Antony and such. Um, Israel's still in the middle of this thing. New governors are being appointed. Hyrcanus and Antipater, remember the uh, Antipater being the king of Idu Idumea, Hyrcanus uh, now becoming again, he's finding his power again as high priest. Remember, Hyrcanus was a very bad leader. It's not that he was, he was bad in the sense of he didn't do a good job. He was a weak leader. He didn't have a lot of, he was not assertive. Um, he was not a good leader. Um, they supported Julius Caesar because of course you did, right? Uh, as long as Julius Caesar is alive. Um, and so they sent troops actually to help him. Uh, this would probably be very little, uh, not a lot, but they did still have this agreement, right? This reciprocal agreement. So they send troops to help him to show some measure of fealty. In return, Hyrcanus was given rulership over the Jews. So he was given rulership specifically over the Jewish, Jewish people in that high priestly role. Antipater was made a procurator of Judea. So Antipater was made uh, effectively not just king over Idumea, but all of Judea now. So Hyrcanus gets the Jews themselves, but Antipater gets Judea. They also gave, were given permission to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which if you recall were torn down um, during the bout between Hyrcanus and Aristobulus, when Aristobulus was starting to assert some measure of power and um, uh, Rome didn't like that. So they tore the walls down in Jerusalem 
um, lest there be a barricade. Uh, actually, there was a barricade, and that's why they ended up tearing him down. Under Caesar's authority, the Jews throughout Rome are given freedom to exercise their religion. So he's fine with them doing their thing. They're exercising their own. Now, remember, this is Julius Caesar. This is before Augustus calls himself the son of God, right? So this is Julius Caesar. Israel has a measure of authority here uh, over their own religious system under Hyrcanus. Hyrcanus, again, though, he's a very weak leader. So it's not very long before Antipater overwhelms the weak authority of Hyrcanus. And he appoints his 25-year-old son, whose name is Herod, as the governor of Jerusalem. By 46 BC, Herod's authority is firmly established. Herod is very ambitious. Herod is um, very charismatic. Herod knows how to get what he wants. And, and he will, if, if, if he can, if he has any power in the situation, he will just take what he wants. 43, so a few years after Herod is made governor in, in Judah, and he's, or Jerusalem, and he's made that because Hyrcanus doesn't really have power. Hyrcanus is still there, but he doesn't have any more power over Jerusalem. The Jews still look to Hyrcanus, but Hyrcanus is a weak leader. He's high priest. Typically, the high priest would be the one that rules in Jerusalem. Hyrcanus, is, is, he's lost that power, though. Antipater is assassinated. 41 BC, remember we were talking about Mark Antony. And Mark Antony is down with Cleopatra now, and, um, and, and he's, he, Mark Antony and Octavian are now fighting over the empire. Octavian has the west, Mark Antony has the east. And so Mark Antony has power over Judea, much of Syria, and Egypt. Octavian has North Africa, he's got Italy, he's got Greece, and they're fighting back and forth. But remember that as Mark Antony meets Cleopatra, and then he will become more and more distant, uh, particularly once the war kind of subsides and they each get their regions, he'll become more apathetic, more distant. Um, he strips Hyrcanus of any political authority at, at a point and makes Herod and Phazael, who is another son of Antipater, the tetrarchs of the Jews. And so now you have Herod and you have Phazael and their tetrarchs in this region. They have, which is a step up from a governor. It's a rulership role. And now you have both sons of Antipater, and they own this region, effectively. They're Idumeans. In 40 BC, you have the Parthians. And if you recall from our map, we'll go back a little bit. Uh, Parthian Empire is over here in the east. This one has it um, far, uh, a little bit more there. And uh, so that Parthian Empire... Um, the Parthian, his name is Antigon, uh, um, Antigon, Anti Antigonus, there we go, um, took over. Phazael's killed, so he's coming in from the east. Hyrcanus is in prison. Herod has to flee. He flees to Rome um, as, the, as the Parthians come in. So, again, this region is still very much in flux. Hyrcanus is now in prison. He's the rightful high priest leader. He's of the Hasmonean dynasty, the, the, the one who, after Alexander dies, is, is given authority. Phazael's killed. Herod, his brother, has to flee to Rome. And Herod is not ready to give up his power. He's in Rome, which means he's in a good place, because there he can hobnob with the bigwigs, and he can work on getting his power. Now, um, What's interesting about this is that, remember, Herod was appointed by Mark Antony. Mark Antony doesn't have Rome. Octavian has Rome, right? Mark Antony has the East. And so he flees to Rome. Uh, uh, he picked the right side there um, as it would relate to those things. Antagonus takes a Hebrew name, and he assumes the title of high priest and king. He gives himself the title king. The Jews never gave him title king. Um, and he becomes the high priest. Um, he's not, of course, of the Hasmoneans. He is a Parthian. Um, but he takes that, that mantle. They end up being driven out of Syria. But Antagonus is allowed to remain in authority over Jerusalem for a time. So he works out a, a, a pact with Rome. They, the Parthians are driven out, but he remains until 39 B.C. 39 B.C., 
Herod, who is extremely ambitious, begins to take his, he, he com comes to take his place back. He begins in the south, then he comes up th into Galilee. 37 BC, Herod makes a 65 day siege of Jerusalem. And that siege is very long. Herod is very angry at it taking so long. They end up killing everyone they could find inside the city. It's a blood path. Antigonus is gone. He's killed. And many people are killed. This is, this is uh, a time of tremendous sorrow in Jerusalem once again, as there's a, 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 a great amount of bloodshed as Herod takes control. And he does. Herod is victorious. Of course, the Parthians have already been driven out. Antigonus is, is now dead. And he takes over once again. He, uh, and he would not relinquish that authority until his death. Any questions so far? Or thoughts? Uh, Herod is now a leader, and his struggles in leadership span, he has to gain the loyalty of the people and the nobles and the Hasmonean family, and he also has to wrest this power from Cleopatra. Yes? Were they okay with him? No. Um, but they don't really have any say right now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, when, when, when you ask, are they okay with him? Uh, n no. Um, not, certainly not as high priest or king, right? Um, he's not a Hasmonean. He has no right uh, to such. And um, would they prefer him over Herod? Probably. Um, but I, they, you know, Hyrcanus is in jail. They have no power. They have no leader. They are... They're, they're, they have no means by which to really affect anything at this point. Um, and what we're going to find is that while Herod has done these terrible things, he, there's a lot of people killed in, in Jerusalem within that siege, and then that's not going to be the only time. We see a little bit later he executes 45 of the Jewish nobles and confiscates their property to win loyalty. Um, perhaps those who the people did not like, as it were, um, simultaneously... Um, He's also not, he's not gaining the hearts of the people here. He's just fear. He's gaining fear, right? Um, people are falling in line through fear. And their, fear is a powerful thing. Um, and Herod, especially in his early days, fear was his power. Um, we, we see this all the way to when Jesus is um, born, right? What does he do? He goes and he kills every child to and under in, in an entire region, right? Um, this is just how Herod operated. He, he was ruthless. Yes, sir? Were there uh, two different Herods? Yes. Um, so it started off, uh, this is Herod the Great. This is Herod the Great. Yeah, and this would be technically kind of the first Herod. After that, we have Herod Antipas, and he's going to be... So Herod the Great is the one when Jesus is born. Herod Antipas... Um, will be later, and then uh, uh, he's the one that will, Jesus will stand before in his, at his trial. Um, and um, he is actually not even over, uh, um, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but but the, he, he is over the region of Galilee. And then you have Pontius Pilate at the time that would be over the region of Judea, which is why in Luke 23, when he goes before Pilate, and Pilate says, oh, you're of Galilee, go up to Herod, right? He's your problem. And then Herod's like, oh, yeah, he's here, that's good. And then he sends him back, and that's when Pilate and Herod start getting along, because before that, they didn't get along. Why? Why, why did he get sent to Herod? Well, because Herod was over the region of Galilee, and uh, um, Pontius Pilate was only governor over the region of Judea. So, though he was being, he was arrested in Judea, he was extradited to Galilee um, for his trial. And that's a different Herod. So, yeah. Um, there are several different Herods there. Um, so Herod, now that he's, he, he's in control, what he does recognize, because Herod is an Idumean, right? 
And we'll talk more about the Edomites in just a minute. But Herod's an Edomian, which means he understands the Jews. He understands them well. He knows that if he doesn't get some sort of, if he doesn't pacify the people in some way, shape, or form, he is going to be miserable. Because the Jews are a very stubborn people. The last time somebody tried to wipe them out and remove their distinctives, there was a civil war and Syria got booted out of the region, right? So he has to walk this fine line. And that's why, even though he killed a bunch of people, which gets him into that power, he's going to walk this fine line of killing people when he has to, appeasing people when he has to. Herod is a great... He gave himself the name Herod the Great, but this guy is good at what he does. He's a very good politician. He just has a few more weapons at his disposal, a few more tricks in his bag than a modern-day politician because he can just kill people. Uh, he'd be more like an Iranian politician than an American politician, right? Um, but he, he, uh, he comes into the region, and he's going to try to win the loyalty of these various groups. And uh, again, all these people don't necessarily like each other either. The people and the nobles. Uh, of course, Cleopatra's still there. She's not dead yet. Once Octavian starts to really play his battle, or, or come again, Mark, Antony, and Cleopatra, they kill themselves in Alexandria. Octavian takes the whole, the whole shooting match, right? Um, the Pharisees were very compliant with Herod because they saw Herod as God's judgment on them. And so they said, we've got to submit to this because this is God's judgment. And so th the Pharisees gave him no, no problems, which is interesting considering that the Pharisees kind of came out of that zealot sect initially, right? Things have changed a lot, though, with the Pharisees. They were pretty compliant. Um, the Jewish nobles, they would have been those of the aristocrats, the Sadducees and whatnot. He made an example of them. He confiscated their property. That, of course, made him very wealthy. And then that, that um, also, perhaps to some degree, ingratiated him to the people um, because the nobles would have been um, very wealthy and perhaps hard on the people. And then you had the Hasmonean family. Um, they, he, he did elevate the Hasmoneans back to some measure of authority, a show of authority, uh, religious authority. Um, but he didn't want to. He just gave the people what they wanted, as it were. And then he slowly thought to kind of take them all out whenever he could find a reason to do so. And um, that began with Aristobulus III in 35 BC. So the Hasmoneans, and the Hasmonean dynasty will not exist anymore by the time we get to the New Testament. They will have been killed out. Um, so the high priests in the day are not Hasmonean high priests. They're not a part of that line um, any longer. Um, let's talk about the Edomites a little bit, and we'll gain a little bit more insight into Edom. Uh, they're another major player on this scene. Remember, Edom was the name given to Esau. He's the elder twin brother of Jacob, uh, who would be renamed Israel. Esau is described in Scripture as a profane man, according to Hebrews 12. And we know that he married a Horite, and they became a nation called Edom, as Esau was not a part, he was not given the, uh, he was, sold his birthright, lost his blessing. He was not the one through whom Israel would come. In Numbers chapters 20 and 21, the king of Edom was, would not allow Israel to pass through the land on the way to Canaan. Uh, he uh, was already, there was already a, a measure of antagonism between the children of Israel and the children of Edom at this time. Um, God explicitly told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7, uh, that they may not abhor the Edomites because they are brethren to allow the Edomites to enter into the assembly in the third generation. So unlike the Midianites, unlike uh, the Moabites, who were not allowed to enter into the assembly even under the tenth generation, the Edomites would be allowed into the nation. They, they, they were brethren. The Lord um, had, a, had a plan for them, had a love for them, and so they were allowed to come into the assembly in the third generation. Saul went to war with the Edomites in disobedience to God's command in 1 Samuel chapter 14. David, the Bible says, subdued the Edomites in his day, uh, placing garrisons there, according to 2 Samuel 8. And so he placed garrisons of soldiers there. They were subdued in that time. 
Solomon, the Bible says, fought against Edom, according to 1 Kings 11, slaying every male in the land. Hadad escaped that slaughter and would avenge himself. Uh, he would become a thorn in Solomon's side throughout his days. Edom revolted against Judah in the days of Jehoram. They would still be subjected from the days of David until the days of Jehoram. And we find that in 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 20. We know that Edom was instrumental or helpful to, toward Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Judah. We know that Edom was a part of the rejoicing over the destruction of Jerusalem. And thus, because of that, they earned the judgment of God. Lamentations, Ezekiel, Obadiah, all have curses upon Edom and say that Edom would be ultimately wiped off the face of the earth because they rejoiced in the day of Jerusalem's sorrow. So we have this less than ideal relationship between Israel and Edom. The region of Edom became known in the Greek as Idumea. Judas Maccabeus took their city Hebron in 165 BC. We, we talked about John Hyrcanus a couple weeks ago. He not only destroyed Samaria, right, and tore down their temple, but he also submitted the Edomites to circumcision and to following the law. That is in that uh, time following. So we're talking about 100 or so BC. And so by the time Herod is, is being appointed, his father um, having lived for some time before that, um, there is a understanding, a, a good understanding of Jewish culture, but there's not a lot of love between these two cultures by any means. Antipater was the leader of Idumea in the time of that civil war between Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II. His son is Herod the Great, who the Bible calls an Edomite. He was king of Judea at the time of Jesus' birth. And Hero, uh, as, I, as we've already seen, and I write here, Herod was a ferocious leader, a violent leader, killed many Jews, um, did not respect the Jews, but did understand the Jews. And uh, that's important for us to realize is that he did understand them, but he didn't have any particular respect for them. Uh, coming back to our, our um, uh, well, any, any thoughts or questions on the Edomites? Um, we might be able to get through all this tonight. We'll see. In 31 BC, Antony was finally defeated by Octavius. Herod began to seek the good graces of the new Caesar. First, he kills Hyrcanus II. So this, this is the Hyrcanus that had been in jail. Um, he, he, he needs to avoid any rivals, so he kills them. And, and Hyrcanus would thus become the final Hasmonean. Once he's dead, it's done. Herod meets with Caesar in 30 BC, and he walks away with confirmed authority. He's given the land which Cleopatra had previously commanded. And at that time, in order to secure his throne, of course, he's been in the intrigue of Israel for a while now. He knows what's going on. He knows who the power players are. He kills who he needs to kill to be able to establish his authority. He has the full backing now of Caesar Augustus. He's the man in, Ju in Jerusalem, in Judea. From 25 B.C. to 13 B.C., there was a time of true peace and prosperity. And this is kind of that great sigh. Israel, you, you've got to imagine they're exhausted. Spe uh, the Roman Civil War, it, it, it touched everyone. But once Caesar Augustus is in power and, there's, there, and he's, he's established, and the same with the region of, of Judea, Herod's in power and established, and there's like this big, okay, we've got dictators now, but at least it's done. And he began to build up the province. He got access to the Roman coffers. In 24 BC, Herod builds a, a grand palace in Jerusalem. 22 BC, he builds this really beautiful city on the, uh, uh, on the, the coast of, of the Sea of Galilee called Caesarea, named for the Caesar, right? It took 12 years to complete. This, uh, if, if, if you look in the history book, Caesarea was supposed to be a, a, just a gorgeous city. And so, so the Jews now in, in Galilee, they've got this beautiful city there, Caesarea. And you've got this grand, uh, Jerusalem's being built up and it's made very grand. 
In 20 BC, um, Herod begins something more ambitious than any of, anything before, and this was a renovation of Zerubbabel's temple. The temple proper was actually completed very quickly, but then he began to build up everything around the temple, uh, building a, a massive complex. If you uh, remember, I, I guess I don't, I don't have it here this evening, but if you remember, uh, if, you've, if, if you've ever remembered the, the slide I've put up of all the different temples, Solomon's temple is, is fairly small, and then Herod's temple is 10 times the size of Solomon's temple. It is massive. And then the reason why I typically put that up is to show you Ezekiel's temple, and the temple in Ezekiel is actually bigger than the Temple Mount, um, which is why we, we know it hasn't been built yet, because it's, it's significantly bigger than, than Mount Moriah. So something's going to have to change before that temple gets built. Um, he begins this temple. The whole complex would not be finished until 62 AD. And that's pretty significant because you think we're in 20 BC, so that's 82 years for this thing to get built. And remember, the temple is torn down brick by brick in 70 AD. So it's only standing for eight years in its completed form before Herod tears it down brick, brick by brick, or not Herod, Herod's dead, before Rome tears it down brick by brick at the time of, of Israel's dissolution. Um, one of the history books writes this, he who has not seen Herod's temple has never seen anything beautiful. It was a truly, truly grand complex, a massive complex, um, having the temple proper in the center there, and then uh, this is where you have, you have the court of men and the, and the court of women and then the court of the Gentiles. And then you have what's called Solomon's porch. And that's where Jesus was walking. Um, that, that's, and, and so all throughout this complex, Solomon's porch would be here, but all throughout this complex, you've got um, uh, just a, a massive number of elements, all of which would lead for commerce and for... Uh, places to meet and, and such. If you've never studied Herod's temple, uh, it, it really was a massive complex, a great deal um, going on there. Um, this, this was the court of the Gentiles, as it says here. Um, uh, according to this, actually, this, this was Solomon's porch, the outer, the outer port here, not, not this inner. That would be the court of women, uh, and then you'd have the court um, for the men there. And no Gentiles could go within the boundaries of the court. And, and remember, this was Herod's way of kind of appeasing, right, them. So you had all of these various elements of Herod uh, building up for his own grandeur. But this um, complex was a huge bone thrown to Israel. The temple was their life, especially in this time of Pharisaism. This ingratiated them pretty strongly to Herod so that Herod builds this thing. Of course, it's a monument to his glory, but that's not how the Jews see it, and the Jews are pretty pleased. Remember, right before Jesus in Matthew 24 says, this temple's going to be torn down, what were the disciples doing? They were bragging on the temple. Look at this temple. Look at, look at this amazing temple that we have built unto God, right? And... Um, Jesus, you know, was not necessarily impressed um, and talked about how it's going to be torn down. And that, that's what spurs them to ask, what are the signs of the end of the world and such. So we have this massive temple complex that Herod built. And um, this, keeps, this keeps the Jews at bay. Uh, the leadership has this wonderful temple. I mean, the Sadducees, of course, ran it, but the scribes were there too. The Pharisees were very pleased. The common people were very pleased with this thing. Um, so Herod was a good dip diplomat. He was careful to avoid things that would bring him into conflict with Jewish culture when he could avoid it. He had no loyalty to the Jewish religion, but was willing to indulge it to maintain order. From 13 BC to 4 AD, Herod had many interpersonal problems, wives and family and all of these things. Somewhere 3 B.C. to 1 B.C., he hears rumors of this child born to the Jews in Bethlehem. You know the story. Um, he's 
troubled by this when the wise men come to him, probably about two years into Jesus' life, so probably around that 1 B.C. to 1 A.D. time there, and um, kills a bunch of people in the region of Galilee and in Judea, a bunch of children, two years old and, and un under, trying to find this one who was born king of the Jews. Uh, he does not want a political problem. He doesn't want the Jews being fomented by some Messiah. He knows, he's, he knows Jewish culture. He understands the Messiah, all of these things. Um, Herod dies in 4 AD, and he names Archelaus king, uh, his brother Antipas, Tetrarch in Galilee and Persia. And of course, we know that when Jesus comes back uh, from Egypt, Archelaus is reigning in the place of Herod. Um, Antipas is in Galilee, and that should not be Persia, that should be Perea. Um, Matthew chapter 2 speaks of this. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? This is Herod the Great, right? This is that Herod. He's been established now for a number of years. He's the one that built the temple. He's the one that built Caesarea. He, he's um, well established, but he's brutal. And we know that by the way he responds here. Um, uh, maybe a little bit more insight into why when Herod is troubled, all of Jerusalem is troubled with him. When Herod gets troubled, people die. It's been that way for 30 years now, right? So um, he, he, he's not a happy guy. Uh, verse 22 of Matthew 2, when he, when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turns aside into the parts of Galilee. Why Galilee? Because Archelaus has no authority in Galilee. Archelaus has no authority in Galilee. He's a, he has authority over Judea. Galilee is Antipas. Yes, it's Herod's brother, but it's not Herod's family. I mean, posterity, son, right? So he feels much more comfortable in Galilee than he does in Judea for that reason. Um, we talk about Caesar Augustus. It came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be, sh world should be taxed, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. There's controversy about this. Augustus ordered a census of the people for a future taxing in 4 B.C., so many people speak to that, and they believe that it was the census. And the word taxing can mean census. That's fine. That word there is fine, so it may not have been a taxing, but here's the problem with that. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Cyrenius was also called in history uh, Quirinius, and the historians say that he was not governor in Syria until 6 AD, and that he taxed the people at that time. And so they say, well, this doesn't make sense because he's not governor in Syria until 6 AD. And some say, okay, well, the census took place in 4 BC. The taxing took place in 6 AD. Jesus comes on the scene when there's the declaration of the census. It doesn't matter when there was the taxation. But this may not be right. There's a couple of different good explanations for this. Uh, the word first there could actually mean prior. We see it translated a couple of times in scripture prior. This taxis was prior made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Again, you say, well, what about this 6 AD thing? Well, Justin Martyr, in three distinct occasions, states that Jesus was born under the rule of Cyrenius. So it's very possible that history just has the dates a little bit wrong with Cyrenius that there was a taxation in 6, but that he actually became governor of Syria, maybe in a dual rulership position or something, well before that. Um, Justin Martyr was around much closer to history. And if he says th on three distinct occasions, Cyrenius was governor of Syria when Jesus was born, then there may be some sort of historical something that we're just not gleaning, um, whereby Cyrenius was already there and already governor of Syria, when you add that especially to, to what we find in the Bible. Uh, any thoughts or insights into that? Questions? Sir? Just with that, I mean, there are different questions of like what Herod's death was and other things too that have been, and people have found, and I think you'll see this more modern kind of one day, yep. older manuscripts having different dates. So things that were lost in translation. 
Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there is a lot of question marks, um, which record keeping was getting a lot better by this time, but there are still a lot of question marks around various exact dates of these events, even around the, the, the events surrounding Jesus' birth. Uh, you know, somewhere from 4 BC to 1 AD is really the birth range there. Um, there's, there's some question marks as to that. There's some question marks as to his crucifixion and all of that. So there, there are still some things there that um, are, are in flux, as well as um, the nature of the taxation, right, and the census and all of these various things. Um, we do know that there, well, that there, there's better there's better historical documentation for that census in 4 BC. So you will find in more modern translations the word census rather than taxation. And again, I'm comfortable with that. Um, but the King James translators did use the word taxation because they had a slightly different understanding of the history. Um, and those guys were really, really smart. So uh, anytime, there's, anytime the King James translators make a deliberate decision based upon what they know, they're probably right. Um, those guys, they knew history, they knew languages, and they're, they're, it was the best minds that the world had to offer, all being best pious minds that the world had to offer into that translation. Um, there's, a lot of good do there's a lot of good stuff out there. Answers in Genesis has a lot of good stuff on it um, as far as talking through the various historical elements of it, uh, and, and any, any number of other ministries speak to it as well. So you can certainly look up more info on that if you're if you're curious. Yes, sir. Yeah, just one more thing back to just commenting on Herod's temple. Mm. It's just interesting um, reading through Acts right now and how much of the early disciples, especially the first like Acts two, three, and four, they're doing a lot of their preaching in Solomon's yep. porch there, which is interesting. And then also thinking about when Paul is causing the riot and it's escorted out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the temple is the staging area for the early Christians. Um, they would meet in their houses to pray and whatnot, but when they, when they preached and when they taught, they'd go to the temple. They'd go to Solomon's porch. Um, people were there all the time. They were, they were preaching to them. They would meet there, and they'd, do, they, they, they'd meet there as, as believers. Um, the, this was the hub of Jewish society. Um, everything happened around the temple. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and they, you know, we ought to obey God rather than men, right? And and this idea, even. Um, Well, right. I mean, even, even when you know Peter was thrown in prison and he was released and whatnot, he was he was back at it, right? Um, and th this was the place. They, they weren't hiding, that's for sure. Um, and th this th this would be the go the golden gate right here that they'd go through and enter. Yes, sir. Um, from what I under, I, I know there's still portions of the eastern gate or the eastern wall that are standing. Right. So um, it, it would not have been all of Solomon's porch that was torn down. It would have definitely been at least this whole complex. Uh, maybe as well uh, the, the court of the Gentiles, which was this part right here. And then, um, you know, then you had the court of women, all of that, obviously. Um, um, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know. You know, obviously they had the fortress here and everything connected to it. This was a place of commerce too and everything. Although Jerusalem was pretty well destroyed in that time. But yeah, it was. It would definitely have been 
the pro at least the proper, the, the, the complex proper. We know that a portion of the eastern wall is still up. Like Sam said, that's the Wailing Wall today. Um, and so that part was not torn down. Okay. There's so much more we could, I mean, we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks, right, talking through everything having to do with this. Um, following Herod the Great, there was a tetrarchy, four rulers, that took Herod's kingdom. Archelaus received Idumea, Judea, and Samaria. He would eventually be replaced by Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate is the one that is there when Jesus is doing his thing. Now, um, then you have Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas received Galilee and Perea. Then you had Philip I, and he received the northern region of Ituria and Trachonitis. And then Lysanias received Abilene, which um, would have been the west there. So um, Archelaus was in Judea, Idumea, Samaria. Antipas got Galilee as well as Perea. And then Philip was up here. And um, again, we had already mentioned this, but this is why there was a measure of safety in going from region to region. Galilee and Judea did not have the same leader. And in the days of Pontius Pilate, Antipas and Pontius Pilate, until, until Jesus came around and, and they were tossing him back and forth, they didn't get along. Which means if, if a person was in Galilee and, and Pontius Pilate wanted him extradited to Jerusalem, Antipas wasn't going to play along. He didn't care. These guys wanted power, and they were kind of, uh, they, they were getting in each other's way. So there was not a lot of, uh, a lot of help. They weren't helping each other. They weren't interested in each other's uh, be well-being or best interests or anything of the sort. And so because of this, very similar to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, right? The Sadducees had authority, and the high priest had authority in Judea, but not really in Galilee. So Jesus could minister in Galilee with impunity. He could go there, he could say what he wanted, and the Sadducees, the high priest, really couldn't touch him. Uh, they couldn't get him extradited because Archelaus and then eventually Pontius Pilate uh, didn't really have a thing going with Antipas where they'd work with each other in that way. This was one of the things about being a territory, right? That these guys, what they were in it for was they were in it for power, they were in it for money. They, they were bureaucrats. They were politicians. They had no, there was no reason why Archelaus should work with Antipas. Now, it was uncle and nephew, but there was a power play here, right? And then especially once Pontius Pilate takes over, there's no reason why they should work with each other. Me working with you is not going to get me ahead in Rome. It's not going to get me anywhere with Caesar. Why should I work with you, right? Unless somehow this can be good for me. And so because you had that kind of a relationship, um, that's why it's so, it, it seems so strange, right? That, I mean, even in the days of Paul, right? Paul stops in Galilee and he's talking to the men in Capernaum. In, at the, at the, was it Capernaum at the church there? What did we say it was? I don't remember now. But he's talking to the church there and they say, don't go into Judea. Once he gets into Judea, his problems start. Even though they're both Israel, there's a, a big difference between operating in Galilee and operating in Judea. There's a whole different legal structure there. And that is it. With that, well, yes, sir? Sorry. Uh, was it Archelaus the one, or which Herod killed John the Baptist? Um, that... Good question. It wasn't Antipas, because Antipas was still alive in Jesus' day. Yeah, because it was Philip who had, he had taken Philip's wife. I wonder if, is it Archelaus? Let's take a look here. Oh, that's really small. Oh, that's not even showing anything. Let's see here. Um, yeah, so Herod the Great 
dies in four, so that's too, way too early. Um, Herod the Tetrarch. We might have to look that up. Um, but Herod the Tetrarch, no, it's, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, we'll have to look. I'm, I'm curious myself because unless, which Herod killed John the Baptist? Um, we know that he died. Um, so it couldn't have been Herod Antipas. I wonder if Archelaus was also a Herod, technically. No, it's... Oh, oh, so he dies afterwards. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not when Jesus raises from the dead. It's, it's Jesus... And then Herod wants to meet Jesus because he wants to see him do some magic tricks, right? And if that's the same Herod, but is that the same Herod? Because Herod, I think it is, because then it's after that. It's because it's in the book of Acts that it talks about him exalting himself and then dying, right? So I think it is, it would, be, it would probably be Antipas then. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so that's Herod Antipas. He's the one that kills John the Baptist. He, um, he meets Jesus, and he wants to meet Jesus First off, because he wants to see him do some tricks. But second, because he's heard of this guy, and because initially he thought that this was John the Baptist come back to life. After Jesus is dead, it's when Herod is then exalting himself and not giving glory to God that he dies and the worms eat him, right? So, um, yeah, so that would probably be Antipas. And that's, yeah, and, and those regions, you know, he and Philip are, are also right there next to each other with the region of Galilee and the region of Ituria there. Um, yep. East, yep. Yeah, and that was, that was all Antipas. Good question. Anything else? All right, we did go a little bit over, but we're finished now. So that, that, is, that is the intertestamental period leading up. Now, obviously, we could have continued, and you talk a little bit more about Jesus dying, and, and we did talk about who he stood before. We get into the days of Paul, and we understand that in Paul's day, which was significantly later, of course, Paul's trial and then being sent to Rome, uh, the final time he's, he's in Rome, Around the time he's writing Second Timothy, we believe he would have been standing before Nero in that time. Um, and, of course, Nero becomes the one who deeply demonizes the Christians, uh, burns down Rome, flames it on Christians, and then the persecution starts in a way that the Christians had never seen before until the days of... Um, um, uh, Constantine, thank you. At which point uh, Christianity is no longer illegal, and then that's really when the Roman Catholic Church begins its infancy because now a bunch of pagans say, oh, Caesar is Christian, which means everyone becomes Christian, which means pagans come into the church, and because the church is now popular, and then that's where you get the merging of the pagan with the Christian. And uh, it, will be, it would be some time before the Roman Catholic Church would truly be established. We're talking, you know, a good portion of time. You'd have the iconoclastic controversy. You'd have the split of the empire into west and east. Uh, west being the Roman Empire, the, the Western Roman Empire uh, with their capital in Rome, and then the Eastern Empire, the capital being Constantinople. And um, then you'd have the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church would become deeply corrupt, and the Eastern Orthodox Church would actually maintain a level. A, a, a level of purity, not complete purity, but 
the Greek Orthodox Catholic Church would maintain a, a modicum of purity. That's the one that would spread into Russia and become the Russian Orthodox Church. And it is through that Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, um, that we would actually trace our Bibles as well um, through the Greek texts that were preserved because the Greek, the Greek Orthodox Church used the Greek texts, not, they didn't switch over to the Latin Vulgate like the Roman uh, Church did. And so we can trace them through that time. And, you know, that could go on forever. We could talk history for, for the rest of time. But um, I, I hope that this series, and we've talked about it many, many times throughout, gives you insight into what was going on in the New Testament. Who are these Samaritans? Why is the parable of the Good Samaritan so, such a scandalous parable? Um, why is Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well such a scandal? Um, why, uh, wh why was the law, which had been effectively disregarded for, for 500 years from Solomon till, till the uh, captivity, so important in, in, the, in Jesus' day? Who are these Pharisees? Who are these Sadducees? Um, who are these zealots that are being talked about? Why is there an Idumean that's ruling over, Jeru uh, over Judea? Um, and, and over Galilee, and over Samaria. Um, why, wh where did Rome come from? Last time we left them in Malachi, they were under Persia. No, were they still under Medo-Persia? They were. Um, and then, you know, there, so much had changed, and I hope that within this study, you can see where those changes come from, and then understand the nationalistic fervor of Israel. Even as early as Herod's overthrow and, and, and the establishment of the Roman Empire under Caesar Augustus, Israel had seen nothing but war. I mean, they had been, sat, I, how many times had Jerusalem been ransacked by, uh, in that 450 years? Uh, how many people had died in the name of politicians, right? In the name of politicians that aren't even connected. How many, you know, when, when Syria and Egypt are fighting back and forth and Jerusalem's right in the middle. When, when Rome comes in and Jerusalem's stuck in that. And all of these people are dying for kings that they don't even care about. They just want to be free. They want to have their own king. They want their Messiah. Their Messiah is the one that has promised to undo all of this, right? And then when Messiah comes, they've got this, this religious industrial complex in place where they believe that they can make themselves righteous enough for God. And Messiah comes and they're completely taken aback by the fact that Messiah is plucking corn on the Sabbath day, healing on the Sabbath day. Because those are things that the Pharisees, through the laws that they had elevated to, through the, the traditions they'd elevated to laws from the days of the Maccabees, when they elevated Ezra's traditions, Ezra had put together all of those standards. In the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, Ezra had put together all of these things as a way to keep the people doing right, not as law itself, Maccabees elevated that to law itself and the, the, has, the, 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 the Hasidic, Hasidics, right, in the days of the Maccabees. And I, I, I don't know if it was this last week or the week before that I mentioned this, but imagine with me, you're studying the history books going back to the Maccabees, the overthrow of, of and, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Every year you're lighting that menorah to remember when the temple was cleansed, because that's where the Feast of Lights came from, 164 BC and the cleansing of the temple. You're lighting that every year and you're remembering this great deliverance. You have a seat at the Passover Seder for Elijah that's sitting empty every year waiting for the Elijah who would come because Elijah would come before Messiah, right? So you have a seat for Elijah, the voice crying in the wilderness, until the day that Messiah would come. Passover, Elijah's seat is there. Uh, Hanukkah, you're lighting the menorah to remember the blood that was shed for freedom, for sovereignty in the name of your Messiah. You've got all of this stuff happening and your mind is on the sacrifice of your fathers and grandfathers for this land and your mind is on the Messiah who is to come. Now imagine all of that nationalistic fervor, all of that sacrifice for this law, right? Remember, in the days of the Maccabees, you got, if you were circumcised, you got killed. If, you, if they found the law, 
You got killed. That's probably where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. They were hidden in the time and preserved in such a way because they were hidden at the time when Syrians were, were killing you if you had a copy of the law. If you, if, if, if you had any connection to Judaism, there was, you, were, you were a traitor to Syria. All of that. And then Messiah comes on the scene. The voice crying in the wilderness. He comes and he says, he, and, and that's John the Baptist, right? And Jesus says, if, you, if, you, if you'll accept it, that is Elijah. And then Jesus is there. And he says, I'm Messiah. And the Pharisees are thinking, Messiah, political leader, political overthrow. Rome is done. We're finally going to have our king. And they're thinking, this, this law, going back to the Maccabees, back when, when we finally overthrew Syria through the civil war that we fought and we died for, and, and then Jesus comes plucking corn on the Sabbath. And, and, and then you get a little bit farther. They kill Jesus, and, and Paul says, at the Council of Jerusalem, all of these believing Pharisees there, and Paul says, you don't have to be circumcised to be right with God. Imagine how that would play among a people whose grandfathers and great-grandfathers died over that very issue because they refused to bow the knee to the Hellenizers. And you can see just how their history led them to this conflict between where, where they had elevated the law and they have elevated their forefathers and they'd elevated all their nationalism above God, in the name of God. And Jesus came and he said, it's not enough. Nationalism isn't enough. God can of these stones make children unto Abraham. Wow. What, what must that have done to the mindset of the people that, I mean, to, like, like, to the Maccabean mindset, right? <laughs> but no, I mean, no, that's the whole point. What must that have done to people who were fighting with the Samaritans. John Hyrcanus goes and says, you're half-breeds, and he destroys the Samaritan temple in Gerizim, and Gerizim, and Jesus says, God can of these stones make children of, unto, of Abraham. Was it Jesus? John? I think it was, it, was, it was Jesus. He was really attacking their sacred cows. You can understand why they were so angry. And then, of course, we add to that the fact that by this point, it's very clear that the high priest, was they were just politicians, which means they were into power. They weren't, it wasn't about religion for them. Religion was there, but it was about power. It was about, they were saying, how can we keep Rome from destroying us? How can we keep, how can we keep things status quo? Because they were politicians. Jesus really overturned the apple cart, didn't he? So he had to die. And then, of course, these Christians. So they get arrested. And in the midst of these Christians and Jesus and these politicians, you have people who were in the political sphere but who actually believed. You have a Nicodemus. And so you have these people who, it, it's real to them. It's not just politics to them. Boy, and does that just throw a little bit of a wrench into the gears, too. Because now you've got this political thing going on, and then you've got people among the Sanhedrin who actually believe, and who actually get it, and who actually, and he, he is the Christ. And so it's quite, it's quite a, uh, an environment, but the New Testament is, uh, the Gospels in particular, they're not, they make a lot more sense when you understand the history. Um, and to know exactly why Jesus came when he did and why God wove history together to bring Christ at that time. Why did God wait X number of thousands of years from his promises to bring Jesus? Because he was working out a plan. And if, as you study the history, Jesus came at the exact perfect time in history for what needed to be done. And until that time, the law, that's why the law was put in place as a placeholder to bring us to Christ, right? It's put in place for transgressions, to be a schoolmaster, to show us why we needed Christ until the fullness of the time would come. It was not random when Jesus came or why Jesus came, when he did, where he did, as he did. 
when Caesar Augustus was there, when he just declared himself the son of God, what, when the Roman Empire, any of it. It was, it was, God's design is just all over in it. Okay, very good. Next week we will uh, go through the difference between Judaism and Christianity, as I mentioned, um, maybe next week, maybe two weeks, and then after that we'll, we'll move into um, something, we'll, we'll get back into scripture, get back into scriptural study. Um, rather than history. But thank you for your, your indulgence. Thank you for listening. I hope it was edifying, helpful. Um, I'm sure not all of my history was 100% accurate. Um, there's only so much that you can do in this forum, and uh, it's been put together over a number of years. But uh, and I apologize for wherever there might have been inaccuracies and such um, in the timetable. But um, uh, that will give you a really good starting point. If you want more, um, read Josephus. Uh, Edersheim, as I mentioned last time, uh, a couple weeks ago, has a really good history on the Jewish people um, that's very, very well done. Um, Usher's chronology has a lot of the general um, chronology that's you know, beyond just uh, Israel. And of course, Herodotus and, and, and such as well, as far as the, the historians. But if you want kind of a Jewish perspective, remember Josephus isn't always accurate, but he gives a lot of really good insight um, into some things, and he's, he's fairly easy to read as well. Um, and a lot of what he does, other than, of course, the intertestamental period, follows the Bible. So you can read the Bible, and then you can read his account and find some interesting places where things, where things are parallel and where things diverge, and that, that can be helpful to you. And it's free online, so easy, easy to access. Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.